wanted to start the American AF movement. Freedom is fragile, very fragile. It takes a certain level of intestinal fortitude to stand up and say and do the right thing to preserve the freedoms that so many have paid a large price for. About being in the military and that recruiter said, it's not Biden's army, it's your army, it's his army, it's his army, it's, it's all of our army. American tactical. American as f- Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. I want to make it clear that the views expressed by our hosts are not considered the official stance of MBR views. Remember, this is all about having fun and enjoying the ride. HGTV Sports, it's in the cave. I will say they are looking extremely solid. And I do love to see an underdog story, you know, with the young team coming in to get the win. But. So, mother environment, or mother area, they come up to a place that gets really, really cold and they just they're trying to hold. They're not used to it. But I was missing all that time in it. Big play Kick it out to Bryant. Pass it over to Cox for three. Got it! Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of HGTV Sports in the Cave. Your boy, Caveman. Joining me is HG. We got H-Train running sound for us this morning. Huge weekend in sports, man. Yeah, Absolutely lots, massive. Lots going down. UFL Week 2, WrestleMania, the National Championship for men's and women's. We got the NBA. NFL draft, WNBA draft coming up. NBA playoff race is heating up as well. So much stuff to talk a about this week. On. Really, uh, this is a huge weekend. Yeah, I think we, uh, we're going to kick it off. We're going to talk about both the men's and women's final fours and national championships. Yeah. As we, we get into that, because a lot to break down from those games. And let's uh, let's start on the women's side today. So just going to go through the, the final four uh, real quickly here, because we all know who won the, over the weekend. But unfortunately, to see NC State go down. But yeah. And, and bo- both uh, final four games. So first, yeah. I mean, South Carolina. Yes, blew it's out just, of the water. just dominated all year, man. That is such this is what I was bringing it back to before the tournament. That they are just such a deep team. We were saying before this whole tournament even kicked off, and they they proved it once again. Their bench really gets it done for them, and Don Staley is just an, an amazing coach. I mean, it was a close game going into halftime, and then. It was, it all took was one bad quarter for NC State and that was it. Yeah. South Carolina outscores them twenty nine to six in the third quarter. Cardoza, twenty two points and eleven boards. She does that in only three quarters. They took her out. For, yeah, she, she didn't even play even the fourth. Tweaked her ankle a little. Uh, Raven Johnson, Tina, uh, Tahina Pow Pow, uh, had thirteen and ten. Ashlyn Watkins with twenty rebounds off the bench. Twenty boards that game. She went off. There's. She yeah. didn't even need to score that many points. They, just, they have so many good players on the team that are able to step up and do something. And then on, on the other side, the Wolfpack, man, Isaiah James, she was forced to play all 40 minutes. And Zoe Brooks was the only Wolfpack player to score coming off the bench. 12. South Carolina's South Carolina's bench outscored North Carolina State's 30 to 12. That made a huge difference. It was even worse in the championship match <laughs> against, against Iowa. Yeah, we'll, but we we'll good run for, for NC State. It really was on, on both sides of the of the tournament, and they definitely some interesting questions there. I know Isaiah James; she has one more year of avail- of eligibility left. Does she want to declare for the WNBA draft? What's going to happen there? I mean, she was really impressive this whole tournament. 
Definitely. And then playing and, an undefeated team for the yeah. whole game, still giving them 20. And, shot pretty efficiently. I mean, even though they were a three seed, I think they were they were one of those three seeds that got writ- written off as, you know, having an easy schedule or that that wouldn't have made a deep run in this tournament. But they proved a lot of people wrong. Yeah, they knocked off a two seed and a one seed to make their way to this final four. So good run for them in the women's side. Mm-hmm. It just got away from them. Like you said, it was completely tied up, even first half across the board. That's in the second quarter, South Carolina scored one more point than NC State, but it was uh, the 29 to 6 third quarter really killed them. That one, one bad quarter just ruined their whole game. And that, and then, I mean, credit to South Carolina, they, they got up big and then they never really let their foot up off the gas because they learned from earlier in the year. They had nearly blown a couple of big leads early in the year. They almost blew one in this tournament to Indiana earlier, too. So they just they locked in and and went for the kill shot. But if we go over the Yukon uh Iowa game, that was another fantastic game. That was a battle. Yukon, I three players above 10 points here. Paige Beckers with the 17. They actually did a pretty decent job at limiting her to having the ball less. It kind of forced the other players like Edwards and KK Arnold to go off a little bit, but like I, like I saw in that game, K.K. Arnold is really good defender. Her and Nika Mule held Caitlin Clark to only 20 points that game. And she needed, I mean, that's, needed help from that stulky 23-point game. That does really tell you her. how good Caitlin Clark is. Where, you know, having a game where she goes 21-9-7, and, and that's considered being held relatively in check. For yeah, her. nearly a triple-double <laughs> is holding her in check. Yeah, we're, we're like, they did a good job defending her. They, they honestly really did, even without the points. Because you see she shot 3 for 11 from 3 and 7 for 18. They made their work for so every bucket. She, she had to fight it. for it. And towards the end there, they completely had her stopped. Like they were, She wasn't able to get any shots up in the second half as she was in the first. She had 18 in the first quarter. So that's it shows for the rest of the game that they really did a good job limiting her scoring. It made her do it every on other places in the floor, not just putting the ball in the basket. Paige Beckers, though. I, actually, before I talk about Paige Beckers, how do you feel about that uh, screen call at the end of the game? That was a moving screen. Because she did, Edwards did slightly, just slightly get the hips when you watch that in slow motion. Gabby Marshall sold it a little bit, which you know obviously added to the call, but Edwards moved on that screen. It's like if you get, if you're gonna call it in the beginning, call it in the end, and you can clearly see that she she shifted her hips to get that before the screen actually got set. It's an unfortunate way to end saw, their season. But. I saw a really good angle too, where you can actually even see like a a big step by Edwards to to get into the, as as Marshalls is making contact with her too. So I know it was a tough call for the for your season to end, but it was a moving screen, and you can't do it. I saw a funny interaction where, where Angel Reese is like, "Wait, that was a moving screen," and someone else goes through. He's like, "So like, yes, Angel, that's why you get so many foul calls on that." It's <laughs> like, a good oh. point. Good point. I was like, "Dang." Um, I know it's. Just, I know we hate like the calls like that in these clutch moments, but I know that co- that does come back to, to coaching where th- this was an instance where I don't think it was a bad call. I mean, it was really once I saw some replays and some slow mos of it, I was like, Oh wow, that's actually extremely obvious. Yeah. And we, the, the officials got it right in real speed. So I mean, good on them. Uh, I think I think the officiating for a lot of the tournament had it was pretty good. Was really good. The only really bad bungled call I can think about was, uh, was Stanford. Uh, Stanford. Yeah, Stanford, Stanford versus Kansas. Kansas, which still eh, man enrages me to this day because that was that was one of the best chase downs for like from behind blocks I've ever seen. Just the way he positioned himself. The time in the game too the is timing, just perfect. Yeah, like one of the best I've seen in all like any basketball game, you know, whether it be college, NBA, Euro League, 
high school. Like, well, whatever, man. That was a thing of beauty, and it didn't count. Which that's gonna that's gonna haunt me. Uh, uh, not as much as like uh, Sanford fans and alumni, but <laughs> just you know, as a, a savant to the game. That that one definitely will haunt me too. It's like when I. I'm watching an NBA or NFL meme video, and then you know the Minneapolis miracle randomly gets thrown in there, and I'm like, why is why is, why is my team just, catching strays right now? Strays. Like, what did I do? So now, if your team is uh, Samford, maybe I'll throw that into an edit. <laughs> Have to remind you guys, <laughs> Paige Beckers. She had to play the whole 40 minutes though, and I actually didn't know that she got injured quite a while ago and missed 57 games. So this was kind of her comeback season to get your team to a three seed, go all the way to the final four with three of her teammates also being injured throughout the season. Mika Mule, yeah. Shade went down, the freshman, and Edwards missed a few games this season. So with all the injuries that they had, making it making it all the way to the final four and almost beating Iowa. I mean, really impressive. Impressive. You could tell that UConn. they were that team. They were banged up a lot of the tournament too, and weren't very deep because they for most of their games only six girls ever played it was a starting five and then ice brady coming yep. off the bench and so. she was actually pretty solid from the mid-range towards the end it kind of kept the kept the huskies in it yeah so i mean that was a battle of I'm not sure if beckers is is this clearing for the draft or not but if she is, that's was probably the two best point guards in in collegiate basketball squaring off against each other. Oh yeah, a little showdown. Well, let's get to the the national championship now. Oh yeah, because so this it, game was. Oh man, it was it was close for a while, but again, it, it was the death of South Carolina that allowed them to pull away at the end. I mean, you just, you got to hear this stat. They out their bench outscored Iowa's thirty-seven to nothing. Iowa got zero bench. Excuse me, got zero bench points. And they they only had two girls come off the bench, combining for eighteen minutes total. But it just shows how deep South Carolina is that they use all nine players in their rotation at any moment in the game, and they're they're fine with it. Like they they're, they trust who they have on the floor. So much chemistry between those girls that like. It's so hard to stop once and, everybody's going. Yeah, Don Staley knows exactly what pieces she's got on her chessboard and how to use them, and when to use them. And I, I think you, you saw like late into that game the fatigue that started hitting a lot of these girls in Iowa because they had been playing pretty much the entire game. Caitlin Clark, even, Gabby, even Marshall, Caitlin Clark, yeah, and Kate Martin. They all played forty minutes. Yeah, they and, all played the whole game. I, I just, I think at the end they just looked like they were gassed. They were. They were running out of steam. Where meanwhile, you had like Cardoza; she was getting plenty of rest. Like Raven Johnson, Malaysia Falili, were you know, or Falili was also coming off the bench. But Raven Johnson was getting rest. Um, and all this was just all these all these bench players, like young young freshman girls that were you know inexperienced in the collegiate basketball world were just coming in and making a difference. And Raven Johnson, honestly, she's. I don't want to. I don't want to talk smack here. So, sound like I'm being a jerk, but she pulled off like a, a Draymond Green stat line, <laughs> one for eleven, zero oh for four from three. But she had she had the clamps on Caitlin Clark she, there for a little bit. Uh, there was a few possessions she definitely she was had playing, the better of. She her. was definitely the best defender on Clark, and that, that was that's a big another reason South Carolina can call themselves a champion. Why they went undefeated this season. Is it's this unselfish play where it's like, I'm not, I'm not shooting the ball well. I'm not contributing points to the team. Instead of getting down on myself, what am I going to do? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to lock, lock up down the best player. on the other end. That's why she I'm still play plays defense. 37 minutes. Yeah, she can make one shot, one free throw, and still play nearly the entire game. And that's, I mean, that's a coach's dream right there, where you're like, you know. A player that's not, I'm not going to just get down on myself because I'm not making shots. I'm getting out there. I'm locking up on defense. I'm clamping down. And it's clamp, she, good on her for, yeah. she realizes that's the biggest game of the season. Don't want your emotions and nerves to get it in the way. And like that time, it's the worst moment. Th this has got to be one of the, like the most unlikely 
teams like teams to go undefeated and then win the championship because it's a pretty new squad from the one that went undefeated and lost Iowa in the final four last year. They have a lot of freshmen on the roster. A lot of freshmen, a lot of freshmen that played a lot of minutes in a lot of games. Yes. And Don Staley just coached them up so well and played to all of their strengths. Those sophomores so well. are now grizzled vets. Right. I'm a I mean, I don't want to predict anything too early here, but if their depth doesn't go down at all, like we're we could be we could be seeing the same dominance from the Gamecocks next season. Well, I think the only thing that slows them down is like, you know, if Don Staley gets a call from like a professional sports league to come up and coach like <coughs> Washington I, Wizards. I was saying, yeah, it's like I was saying <laughs> on your live, like if she wins in this championship, we got to let her get, take a crack at fixing the Wizards. <coughs> Toronto, maybe? I don't know. I, don't I, don't, know. I, like, I like Darko there in Toronto. Though. I don't wanna... He is pretty solid. Yeah. He is pretty solid. But we were, again, we're talking about how Caitlin Clark was locked down, but it was like she had 38 and 5 in this game. Um, but then, you know, those points didn't come easy. She had to earn a lot at the line. She shot 10 to 28 from the field and just 5 of 13 from three. That's where they limited her. If she, if you get her shooting pretty low percentage from three, which honestly, five of 13 really isn't too terrible. But if you get her just off her game slightly, I, that's how you can get her. Yeah. And they really great job guarding her. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of drop coverage. They put a body on her and it did a great job of keeping her to the baseline and to the outside. It was honestly just it was great, great coaching there from Don Staley yeah. to not let too say, many points go. I, I'm, up. I'm excited to see what Clark can do with professionals. She should have had way more assists. I feel like she was making some incredible passes. That's something that gets overlooked with just how good she is at scoring the ball, but she's an incredible passer as well. And I just was like out like I, I was like saying like screaming out loud on my television, oh you gotta finish that. I oh know. you need to make that like that those missed layups and oh uh, it, it paint like it pains me to see like a beautiful pass go to waste because the, somebody wasn't able to finish it. And I know it's part of the game, but man, is it tough to to see. And so, I mean, in the past two games that Iowa's played, Caitlin Clark's been the leading scorer, well, either the leading scorer or one of the top two scorers, and then she's led the team in rebounds and assists, which... Just carrying the boats. Yeah, that's that's a lot to put on your point guard. Like, that's stuff Russell Westbrook was doing with, like, the Wizards or, like, the year with the Thunder that... That, he, that Kevin Durant record, and yeah. uh, James Harden had already left the team, and it was just him there. The 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 Russell Westbrook vengeance season. That's really, that's honestly how her play reminds me of. She just she just plays with so much confidence too that like even when she's down, she's ready to pull a logo three on you. It's fun to watch her. Can we talk about though with our last two minutes before we switch to the men's the, the jealousy of the jealousy of WNBA players of WNBA players? It's you have somebody insane. that can bring so much relevance to your sport. So let's just hate on her, and, right? And, awesome. That's crazy. It, it's this entire draft class, and Clark is obviously the best prospect in it, and so they're like going after her, and it, it's insane because. I, like you've got the the Caitlin Clark kind of Angel Reese rivalry, or like a, a Caitlin Clark Paige Becker's rivalry, that you can build on as they go pro, you know? Because I mean, let's we're gonna wind the clock back all the way back to like '79. The NBA is struggling; they're not doing very well financially. They've got some good players in the league, but they just don't have these storylines, these narratives going into games that are really selling tickets, but you got this Larry Bird and Magic Johnson rivalry in college and they're com- they're going pro. And I mean, with a, a, a really good class behind them. And then the NBA starts to take off in the eighties behind the bat, the bird Johnson rivalry. One's on the Celtics, one's on the Lakers. And that, that shot the NBA up into you know being a super relevant sports league here in america and you finally you've got players like that coming out here for the wnba and it's 
like the current players and the old old players are hating on them and trying to diminish all they've done. Yeah. And it just looks like petty jealousy because they're not the ones that did it. It's like, ooh, the and, WNBA is going to be a reality check for these girls. I've been grinding for 10 seasons and I just started to hit the rim. <laughs> it's like the, the women's national championship and their final four, it got 18 million views. The, the, the WNBA on average, 6,000. 19 million views for that women's national championship. That's 5 million more than the men's had. And I mean, it wasn't just the play. It wasn't just the tournament. There was a regular season game. This was just one of the instances I saw South Carolina, LSU regular season. It wasn't even the SEC championship. This was back in like January on the sit that same day. It was on at the same as a, uh, the same time as a Miami heat, boston celtics game getting intimate with y'all real quick <laughs> right that that game averaged around 1.56 million views that south carolina lsu game that celtics he game was averaging around 1.38 million they're getting more views so than the nba people yeah, it's Come on. like the WNBA players are always complaining about how nobody wants is, is why is there isn't a lot of viewership and and you have a, such a strong class of female hoopers that are cut that are going to come into your league that could bring millions of, of dollars and viewership to you. Like this, this is where this is, uh, you're going to get more money because the league's going to be making more money. Why it's going to be awesome. Why are we letting point? like, why are we letting ego and pride? Why are we trying to ruin it with that? I mean, that this is just a great opportunity for everybody. I'm like, I genuinely, Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi, their little podcast or whatever, they got a moment to like be on the commentary team for ESPN. I had to change it because they were not talking about the game at all. They were just talking, like having side chats. And it was and, like, and it was just, it was about like, oh, well, like how, what's going to make Caitlin Clark great? And I'm like, well, how about, you know, taking your team all the way to a championship where you're you know average you're averaging the most like points assists and top like three rebounds as a guard sometimes having the most of all, all of those in each game like it like i her her legacy is cemented because she's breaking we we the the, the laundry list of records she broke i mean the all-time d1 scoring record the all-time you know, like free throws made in the tournament, made in the season, points scored in the season. The three point and uh, free throw percentage record yeah. and she, makes. I, sh she broke a, a college three point, the college three point records, uh, threes made in the season record that was held by Steph Curry, who is the greatest three point shooter of all time. She broke his record. I, I know she didn't win a championship, but, but got legends that she broke there legendary teams and, and it was it's just ironic it was that girls that played on those yukon super teams that had like seven to eight first round like WNBA draft picks on them we're talking about how you're not great unless you win a championship like okay. <coughs> diana tarasi i'm like you played on a super team you you played on the collegiate version of like the 2017 warriors like what are we 2018 yeah. warriors what are we like, talking about Diana Taurasi and Sue Bird, one of their halftime conversations that they brought up was like, if Caitlin Clark wins this, or if you win an NCAA championship and don't, or like, if you win an NC, don't win one or win one, does that make you a GOAT or like a great all time conversation? And then they brought up people like Charles Barkley. Just because, you know, Charles Barkley's kind of a mouthpiece. He gets a lot of controversy with his he's a really honest guy. But they they brought up people like Charles Barkley. They even had Jalen Hurts on to talk about that. Speaking of Jalen Hurts, uh, don't you guys remember when he got benched in the national championship with Alabama? <laughs> They're like they had a guy on there that doesn't even have a college championship that he won himself. And he lost he got his benched. Only only pro championship albeit on a kind of ticky tacky call but this and then it shows i saw a screenshot diana tarasi in a yukon jersey and it shows that they had six undefeated championship runs and i was like you want to talk about who's the goat 
when you played on a team that has six undefeated championship runs in the tournament, like, and you want to talk about who's going to be the GOAT? All right. That's, like, that's just crazy to me. That's crazy. You, you know who the GOAT is at, at that UConn University? The recruitment office. That's who the <laughs> GOAT is. How do you have that big of a talent and disparity for that long? All right. <laughs> That's like, like a dynasty. I'm sorry, you have, you have a, yeah, you're on a collegiate dynasty. Like, I don't know. Oh, man. But, well, all right, let's, speaking of UConn, why don't we shift it over so they, to the men's side? They got their revenge for the women's team taking the loss, and they went out and took UConn down by 15 points. And it was honestly a pretty even game. They outscored them by six in the first half and nine in the second. It was just Edie needed way more help. If you look at the field goal percentage of his teammates, Kaufman, Kaufman, Ron, he's he was fifty percent. But other than that, Smith was four for twelve, Lawyer was zero for five, and Lance Jones was you know solid two for three, but he didn't put up a lot of shots. So they weren't really able to get too much going, and only two bench points when they had. Guys like Gillis going in, he had 24 minutes off the bench. And that's the sixth man of the Big East, of the of the nation. Actually, he won that award and came out was just stifled. UConn's defense was f- phenomenal. And I want to just... So, Purdue scored 60 points. They had five players score baskets to contribute to those points. Zach Eady had 37. And Braden Smith had 12. And then the other three, no one no one scored higher than five points. There was like a five points, four points. 65% points. of the points were scored by Zach Eady. UConn did exactly what they had to do to beat Purdue, which was yeah, just make make Eady score everything. Don't don't let anybody else score. Eliminate and those they, perimeter guys like lawyer, unable to make a shot the whole night. That's a win. Uh, That's a win. Braden Smith had, had he had some flashes, but for the most part, I mean, it was a it was kind of a quiet twelve. Outside of a few really good plays, and he didn't even he wasn't able to get you know all those assists that he's been so good at getting. Yeah, I mean they were they were perfectly comfortable letting uh, Killigan or Klingon just guard Edie one on one in the post. He was even in foul trouble late there. It just was too much. Even. All right, yeah. I mean, yeah, you get you gave up thirty seven and ten to Edie, but didn't give up anything to anybody else. And then your entire team scores eleven plus. Your entire yeah. starting five scores eleven or more. Yeah, that's a it's a good recipe for success. What really helped for UConn? They have their their guards are just so big that they're they have such a size advantage. Caravan at six eight listed yeah. as, well he's listed as a forward here but he pretty much pretty much plays around two or three yeah. so but you, i mean you got newton and castle like what six four six yeah they're both six foot six, five four and, or yeah six five just big physical guards and they're stocky so they're ready to put a body on the perimeter and, it's it was the perfect matchup and here's here's the thing is this was a game that was close going into halftime and it was like that Alabama game. You got to give Hardy, um, what well, I'm blanking on his first name, but the the UConn coach I'm credit to another phenomenal. Oh, coach, Dan Hurley. Dan Hurley, um, such great defensive adjustments. I mean, we saw it against Bama, where they they started pulling away there in the second half because of their really because of their defense, and they started taking away the shots that Alabama was being successful on. And here's the thing is like they, they pulled away from Purdue because they they got ED ED got off to a very slow start in the second half because they kept bringing a double team to him and he wasn't getting shots up quick enough. That double team was bothering him. But you know, so then you you're you're guarding four guys with three players when you bring a double team on ED. But the UConn defense did such a good job of rotating to where the ball was going. He wasn't and right able once, to do much. Yeah, once Edie would pass it. There's a guy already on their way to that to the guy that's receiving the ball, so they're right on him as that ball gets to him. And then the guy that comes on the double team, he just slides off to the backside man that's 
that's open and away from the ball, and then boom, you're you're back in your set man to man defense. He started and, off the second half. I think he was over six, and now those when our Klingon already had uh, four fouls at this point, so he got in there late too. And I mean, one thing I would say that double team really disrupted Edie a lot because one issue in his game that at least that I've been seeing one little mistake that he does a lot is he holds the ball very low as a seven foot four center. The yeah. ball should probably never go below your shoulders because no one's going to be able to hold steal it, it. Hold it up. You here. hold it up yeah, here. You, Nobody's taking the ball from you. You can literally do whatever you want. It just how you could easily have your way on any possession. If you just eliminate them being able to steal the ball from you. And that was where a lot of the teams, you know, were able to hang in with Purdue or, and even upset them. Like that's what Wisconsin did to him in the, the big 10 championship. They were just poking the ball out. They have those guards come by and swat it out because he's just keeping it so low. And UConn took, yeah, they were also taking full advantage of that. So that, that's something that Feedy's going to go to the NBA. That's, that's the big f- weakness in his game is like, you got to, you're seven for it. Do not be holding the ball where these guards can just come by and swat it out. Cause that is one of the, it's one of your biggest weaknesses as a bigger guy. That's not very well versed in handling the ball. Like, you know, Victor Wembenyama is kind of pretty much a one through five player, but it, you, if you limit your turnovers as a big man, that's not really the most mobile guy then your game just elevates by so much more because you're an asset. You're a bigger asset. You Less turnovers means more assists or more points for yourself or more points for the team in general, even if you don't get the assist. You just limit limit the takeaways from the other team. But overall, I mean, Purdue, better way to finish off than losing to the 16 seed, am I right? Yeah, much better. <laughs> At least they went, went all the way to the finals this year. And... Gosh, UConn, man, we what another dominant run for them. They have they won it's now thirteen no twelve. Twelve straight tournament games by thirteen or more points. You know, I was I was telling somebody yesterday that they were talking about the same thing. I don't remember Indiana or Purdue making it to the final four since like two thousand something, you know? So it's crazy how that team has – it's crazy how you can see the effect of Bobby Knight not being around. That's that's the only thing I, th- I thought that was crazy and interesting. It's similar to similar to Iowa as well. They're, they, they've been in the championship the past two seasons, but Iowa as a school has never won a national championship. Just like this four, past four seasons with Caitlin Clark, they've been so dominant. And that is, that's probably coming to an end. I don't know if we're going to – yeah, it might be a we'll while. See, we'll before. see what their their recruiting class turns out to be, and you know what what freshmen they and I don't know, step up. But. And I don't know if we talked about this last week, but can I just say that they really did a really good job this year of involving the women's Final Four championship compared to previous years. I that's so much more hype. Yeah, so much more star power. Yeah, and I mean it's just like each game in that tournament just kept breaking uh, the viewership record all the way up until the championship. It got better and better. It was really good. And there was, there was a lot of great competition on, on both sides of the bracket this year. So many big names on every team, like Juju Watkins. I'm forgetting the girl from Ohio State, but she's projected to be a lottery pick as a guard. You've got Cardosa, you know, Utah's. Uh, Peely is going to the draft. There's so many Angel girls Reese, right Cameron now. Bruce. Now, I have a question since we have the NFL draft coming up here pretty soon. You guys are more knowledgeable than I am. But with the NFL draft, it's like a 50-50. Sometimes they suck. Sometimes they're good. Is it that much of a gamble as in like the college draft to go into the NBA? I or is so. there Or is there a bigger gamble with the nba compared to the nfl i think a bigger gamble with the nba only because there's only two rounds there's so you draft so many less players into the nba every season that one guy you pass up on you know could be different it does typically it it is safer to have a a high draft pick in the 
NBA, those guys do typically work out better. Uh, not all of them become superstar players, but they, I feel like we see a lot of, a lot less early round busts in the NBA. Yeah. That, it still happens. It's still possible, but you know, you're, you're a lot more likely to get a good player in your first round in the first round, especially if it's a lottery pick. And then, I mean, it's really hard to hit on the, on the second round picks too. That can, that can be so hit and miss. It's like sometimes like, mo- like it's extremely rare where you get a Nikola Jokic in the second round. Very rare. You're, I mean, you're lucky to get, you know, like a, a decent role player that can maybe off the bench. That, that That's typically more what you, you get from the second round. Or it's just a lot of guys that don't that just kind of bounce around and become journeymen, and even even into the later first round, it can just be a lot tougher. So it, it where that's why in the NFL, you know, it's more of a crapshoot in the first round because a guy can look really impressive in college, and that just doesn't translate to pro. But there are a, a number of success stories with late round draft picks. I mean, just the two biggest ones that come to mind: Brock Purdy so far, and Tom Brady, obviously. Yep. Um, Kirk Cousins, he was also like a fourth round pick. But there are plenty of guys that you that have panned out to have really good careers being late round draft picks or even undrafted. Uh, but more whereas in, in the NBA, typically, you know, the best players that what you're gonna get are those lottery picks and especially high lottery picks. Okay. Yeah, because right it's kind of like we were saying with the betting. That like the bench players are are wildly inconsistent, so you know even even just drafting them it yeah, can be worries. wildly inconsistent. But it is eight thirty around there. We're gonna head on our first music break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about this Pacers and Heat game. Had a couple missed calls there. That Some brutal missed calls that were really costly for the Heat. Detrimental to them in the end of the season here with only a few games left. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Attention all troops. Are you ready to stay connected with the latest news, entertainment, and information tailored for our armed services? Look no further than MBR. Here at MBR, we're more than just a radio station. We're a lifeline for those who serve from the front lines to the home front. We're here to keep you informed, entertained, and connected to your fellow veterans. With our dedicated team of broadcasters, we bring exclusive interviews with military leaders, insights into the latest strategies and technologies, and uplifting stories of bravery and sacrifice. But that's not all. MBR is a nonprofit organization, meaning that every dollar you donate goes directly towards supporting our troops and their families, whether it's providing care packages, funding, scholarships, or offering mental health resources. Your support makes a difference. With that, H Train, can you tell me a little bit about how MBR got started? Well, in 2005, Jim Butler created it so that he could keep contacts with all of his pals over in Iraq. And then when 2018 came, uh, he decided that it it was time for him to retire. He was going to close up the station. And because we've had so many former DJs since 2005. I mean, it was pretty inspiring. We have at least five veterans in every single state, at least. And, you know, it, it just brings us closer together. It creates a family and it creates a family that we, we lost when we got back from Iraq. And mind you that every show is manned by a veteran or a first responder. That's amazing. I love what uh, MBR is doing here. I love being a DJ here as well. Talk to people who have been through situations similar to yours. You're not alone. That's what we do here on MBR. Yeah. And it's nice because if you don't have, if you're not having a radio day and you're just having a bad day. Or, or you don't have a face for radio. We just want to remind you that every show is manned by a veteran or a first responder. So if you've ever had a dog tag, you could be possibly on the show or create your own, as well as military dependents. Together, we'll stay strong, we stay informed, we stay connected. So visit our website and download our app today, MBR. 
MBR, serving those who served while giving veterans, veterans a voice. Brandon Stokely here, and I want to encourage every single one of y'all to keep grinding, keep fighting, keep practicing, keep getting those reps in because that's what's important, right? Keep building, uh, laying down that foundation, and keep working at it, keep practicing. Um, no matter what the results you see right now, it doesn't matter what's going on right now. Look towards the future, and that's what it's all about. So keep working hard, keep practicing, keep getting those reps, and that's what's most, most important right now. So keep up the good work. Best of luck. What's up, everybody? Almost back with Sports in the Cave. HG and I are just putting some shots up. Let me bury this three real quick, though. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Welcome, welcome. HGTV, Sports in the Cave. I'm HG with me, co-host Caveman. We got some breaking news. Something uh, not as major as last week's, you know, Stefan Diggs trade, but we got... Uh, an announcement on who the Eagles will be playing in Brazil in the first this is the first Friday night game the NFL has played uh in week one Friday since, night. Yeah, Ooh. since nineteen seventy. This is our first week one Friday night game since nineteen seventy. And the lucky opponent to be going down to Brazil to play the Eagles is the Green Bay Packers. That's gonna be really so good. That should game. be a pretty good game. The young budding Packers team will get to see Josh Jacobs make his debut, and Jordan Love gets to begin. I mean, it's not really his sophomore season, but like it's his sophomore season of playing, and we'll see as a starter if he can continue what he's done against an Eagles team that is looking to, I mean, re rebound and get back to that dominant team they were in the 2022 season and the first half of the 2023 season so it should be a pretty good game again this is going to be played at uh corinthians arena which is the home of a brazilian soccer club the fc corinthians this is also where the 2014 world cup and the 2016 olympics were played so That's this this venue is used to having some big sporting events and now it will be hosting the first ever South American NFL game. That's going to be awesome. Yep. Good uh, good way to so, branch out there. And lucky us NFL fans, we're going to have you know, the, the traditional Thursday night season opener, then have a game on Friday, then the full slate of games on Sunday, and then more than likely a Monday night doubleheader. So. Oh, man. That... Man, hopefully we don't see a lot of injuries during that week one. Fingers crossed. Everybody knock on wood. That's going to be a lot of games. That the first opening, the first few opening weeks of the NFL are going to be real hot. Yeah. So oh. hopefully well, there will be plenty of action for us all. But already we want to get into our next topic. So this game honestly is it's just it's just dumb. Well, it was there's like literally minutes left in this game, like a minute and a half. Ah, oh, yeah, I was like, it's like seconds. That's when the uh, that's when the call happened on Bam Adebayo. The miss three. There's like a minute forty left in the game when the Tyler Hero three point call. There no call was made. Let me check this article just to make sure that I've got the time right. I believe it. It was uh, fifty five seconds actually. Tyler Hero, he goes fifty five point one, yeah. Yeah, he goes to put up a three point shot, doesn't go, and basically the league sends out a report every week about you know officiating mistakes and things that they believe were called an error or were not called correctly, and so in this game, they say that yeah, Hero he shoots a three, he got fouled by T.J. McConnell, he should have gone to the line to shoot to uh, to shoot three because it was a three point attempt, and then. Later into the game, 17.1 seconds left in the fourth. Bam out of the bio gets called for a foul on Miles Turner, which led the Turner making two free throws. And the league said in this report that Bam made clean contact with the ball simultaneous to Hero initiating, which initiated incidental hand on ball contact to dislodge it from Turner. Miami was out of challenges. They had used one early in the game, but weren't able to challenge this. And I mean, it. 
You're like, oh, well, it's just two free throws. It can't be that big. Well, the Heat lost by two. It was a 117 to 115 loss. And Hero is 83.1% at the free throw line. So that's they either would have tied up or won the game. So, I and mean, after for- that turnover, it should have been a turnover instead of a foul. Yeah. But that would have pretty much sealed the game if take, Hero had made those free throws. You take away those two points from Turner. And I mean, at that point, you just take away those two free throws because he shouldn't have got them. Hero just has to make one, and that could, but he he's off the line to make three. Again, over 80% free, free throw shooter. That makes a big difference. And this was, I mean, this was a huge loss for the Heat. This is a major playoff implications they were playing the six and the seven seed 76ers had a game against the spurs that they also won so they dropped down instead of moving from the eight to the six they stay at the eight i think they were at the seven they were before. actually there at the seven so they, they got jumped, jumped up to the six and knocked down the paces to at least a seventh they might have dropped to the eighth after the sixers won but instead of that indiana stays at the six and then the pacers or, I mean, the, the Sixers win, drop the Heat down to eight. It's such a close, close way to end the season. The East playoff picture, we're going to get into that later. But even still, with this like one or two games left in the season, we're seeing a lot of, a lot of crazy stuff going on in the East. So I'm liking this, but that is just a, that's just a terrible way yeah, and to finish that game. We talked about this in an earlier show, and I want to bring it back up. And anybody watching at home, feel free to, to share your opinions on this matter too. But what can these sports leagues yeah. do to stop this bad, this bad officiating or these missed calls and, and to, to just have some more accountability and, and incentivize officials in close games with major implications to take a second look at things. That's because I mean, I, look, the NBA is admitting, yeah, there are two missed calls here that probably cost the heat this game and major playoff positioning. Is anything going to happen to the officials? Are they no. going to be, just, they'll probably end up calling playoff games. It, it, it It's just, it's wild. They, you're not you're not gonna find them. You're not gonna suspend them. You won't even make them talk to the media. They don't even have to talk to the media after a game. There's just no level of accountability for officiating. And here's the thing that I recently learned. This is and this is for NFL officials. I'm not sure if it's the same as NBA, but they're not full time referees. Like during the off season and like during their week lives, they have like regular jobs. So it's not like people that officiate. 24 7 like their job is just to be a ref they do like other things outside of sports yeah. so it's, it's a, like a, a, a part-time job them. for them it's like their hobby is their part-time job and that's you know refereeing basketball it's like maybe maybe some people that referee full-time should take you know have a crack at officiating some of these games you know, things may be things may turn out differently yeah and it's like it's just the league being cheap, I guess, and not wanting to pay, you know, officials full time is just or full time wages, so they don't. You, like now, you're having subpar officiating in games. Oh, I'm not, I'm not even like most of the time. The officials do a pretty good job. On TikTok, Star says they need to find the refs, like they find the players, or put them on suspension. Exactly. That's, Seriously, that's you I've get fined saying. for celebrating too much, <laughs> but when well, they make I, a bad call and pretty much almost ruin your season. Look, an NBA official can make a terrible call that the league's like, yeah, that was the wrong call and nothing happens to him. But then a player can criticize the officiating and get fined like tens of thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've we've seen it range anywhere from like five to ten thousand to sometimes like a hundred thousand dollar fine. It, it, for being openly critical and this it's like the, the companies just, make so much money off of finding their own players that it's yeah, the, so stupid the league just tries to basically bully and silence and intimidate anybody that wants to speak out against the officiating yeah it's really annoying. and i mean 
this is we're gonna we're gonna get the team builder here, but this is just another something I, I I wanted to bring up that I found interesting with officiating that's happening in front of our eyes is because a lot of t te- a lot of people seem to have a lot of problems with the officials, especially when they play the Lakers. And I was wondering, you know, like why why is that? So watched a little little video on it, and then this I found out that over the last two seasons. The Lakers have had a plus 1,017 free throw differential. So over these last two years, they've shot 1,000 and 17 more free throws than their opponents. You're like, wow, that's a lot. So you're like, well, you know, who's in who's in second place? Like, surely they can't they can't be that that far behind. Well, that's where you'd be wrong because the next three closest teams combined. Amazing. The next three closest teams in free throw differential combined it wouldn't even wouldn't even add up to the Lakers free throw differential. Oh my god. The next closest team oh is the Knicks at plus 358. So the Lakers That's astounding. The Lakers have as a number one team in free throw differential have more than the two, three, and four teams combined. It's just, just insane. So, and they're not even like a high seed, so that's yeah, pretty, that says a lot. So I mean, it makes you think, like, man, would they even make the plan with all these extra free throws? I'm not sure. There was a a game they had recently. They shot 43 free throws while their opponent had 16, and there it got really bad in the third quarter. I believe it was against the Pacers where they shot 15 free throws to just oh one my for Indiana. So they're pretty much they're pretty much like the Purdue of the NBA. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking at this call before we get into team builder on that three. TJ McConnell and Tyler Hero pretty much high fived right here. Look at that. That is the most clear contact you can oh, see right there. <laughs> I'm showing HD the perfect freeze frame. Is... They like just high fived on his release of the shot. That is bad. I cannot believe they missed that. All right, well, we do got to get into team building here for time constraints, but let us know in the comments what you guys are thinking about officiating and Drop any your ideas. favorite no calls. Yeah, I got mine. I know for sure I know my favorite no call. And <laughs> just any ideas that you guys have to fix it. Uh, my favorite no call, one I can just think about, uh, cl- that happened recently, maybe not my all-time favorite, but I, Clippers, Nuggets, uh, you know, Jokic, they're praising Zubox for his great defense. You you go to the freeze frame. Zubox is just like his entire arm is over <laughs> Jokic's both of Jokic's arms in like the shooting <laughs> motion, and Jokic feels that and tries to throw a shot up, and they just don't call it. So Thank Star you. says by November 26, twenty twenty three, NFL players had lost fifteen thousand three hundred eighty eight seven fifty five to fines and suspensions. Not even halfway. And through the season. Oh, my So 15,000 by November. And the se- the season starts like a two months before. Uh, I think I read that wrong. 15 million. 15, 15 million in fines yeah, in November? Say, that's my bad, guys. I'm, I'm really. That's okay. That makes, honestly, for a better reaction. But more holy sense crap. Too, because the NFL loves. It's just like ridiculous amounts of fines are handed out. With that, we got to get in the team builder, everybody. It's almost nine. We got to do it. But let's do it. And I'm putting together a special team. Hold on, I'm having some trouble, guys. Okay. No worries. Well, he's getting the wheel pulled up. Uh, it's being a little difficult with us today. We're going to explain what we're doing this because it's a little different. Uh, so this one, we're a little less in control. Basically, we get to make one decision. That, that's going to kind of determine how our team looks. We're going to do our usual off- or, or our usual NFL one. So, you know, quarterback, running back. Two wide receivers, tight end, O line, defense, and a coach. But we're gonna what we're gonna do that's a little different. So 
obviously quarterbacks on the top, coaches on the bottom of the list. Basically, whoever you get for your first spin, that's going to determine you can determine where you want to start at the top of the list or at the bottom of the list to pick your, you know, either your quarterback or your coach. And then from each spin here on out, you don't get to, you don't get to pick who you're putting on the team. It's just going down the list. So if I start on quarterback, I got to do running back next then receiver, receiver, tight end, line defense coach. It's going to be interesting. So it's a little random. I like this. You, you don't get as much decision on where you put guys, but still, you know, there is some good depth at a lot of these different positions. And you got to be, you're going to have to be strategic. We're going to have to be strategic with how we do this. Let's do that view. So, we was it, did I go first last week or was it you? I went first last week, actually. So it's I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off here. and I'll go first here. So, this will determine where I start on my list. Let's see which team I get. I got the Raiders. I'm going to start with my head coach then and take Antonio Pierce. That's a smart move. That's a very smart move there. So that means now I have to go from top to bottom on my list. So the next spin I get will determine my defense. Let's right. go ahead and give Caveman his first spin. Get out. Buccaneers. Tampa. Ooh. I'll do the opposite of you here. I kind of want to pick their coach because he's honestly kind of a decent coach. But I'm going to go Baker Mayfield at quarterback. Todd Bowles, def Todd Bowles definitely not a bad coach to have, but Baker, man, that guy's a that guy's a gamer. Great competitor. All right, give me my next spin here, H. It just scares me, man. The Falcons and the Buccaneers have so much potential next season. Oh, my defense and is going to be are so mid. The Colts defense. Okay. You guys going to do a mock draft before the draft in a couple weeks? Definitely. Yes, Kyle. We're definitely planning on doing a mock draft. We got 15 days until the NFL draft, everybody. The WNBA draft is less than a week away, so stay on your toes for that as well. Uh, next spin spin here. See, this is going to determine my running back position. The Bills. Ooh, I'll take I'll take Cook. James Cook, that's a good running back. That's solid. And I mean, you don't necessarily have to take the starters too on these positions. You can be like, you know what? I like this guy. That's this true. backup more. Take him too. It's true. Where so you can be a little strategic. Go ahead, give me my next spin. Let's see who I get for my offensive line. Not. To, I'm not mad about the Colts defense. They definitely got some players there. The Jets O line. Ooh, that's actually that's not, pretty solid. That's not terrible. That's kind of a middle of the pack offensive line, but that'll that'll do as long as I can get some playmakers on offense. I got a good coach. This will be so, my wide receiver number one spin here. Got, got your CD. Oh, well, that's that's a good one to get. Cowboys. See, now right. that I have to pick wide receiver too, I'm going to start thinking about some backups here. Then I can see what I can do. All right. Go ahead and give me my next spin. This is going to be for my tight end. Got the Ooh. Dolphins. Dang, who is their tight end? Durham Smythe. Yeah. Durham. Smythe, what a name that is, too. Yeah, All right, good for another spin here. Wide okay, receiver man. number two. Let's see who I get. He is a good run blocker, so I'm not too upset about that. Oh Ooh. my gosh, that's brutal. Oh man, who are you gonna take? Man, we're gonna take Juju and we're gonna hope we never throw the ball to him. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. I, me personally, I would have gone Kendrick Bourne in that situation. I, yeah, I honestly would have, I should have, but. We're, we're gonna hope that's that's your mean pick of the week. You got yeah, that's what I mean. You you always week. gotta pick like some something random. He's gonna come in. He's on this team for the energy. He's gonna make a TikTok on your logo, and then he's not gonna get the ball. Heck yeah! All right. Well, here we go. This is gonna be determined by wide receiver too. So let's see who I get on this next spin. Um, I'm really hoping for a prolific offense like Miami. Ooh, Ooh, the Rams. Oh, that's solid receivers there, actually. That's a good spin. I'm going to go Puka or Cooper Cup. I'm probably going to go Puka. 
That's a solid spin there for a receiver. This All is gonna right. be a tight end. Oh man. Logan Thomas. Logan Thomas. Yes. This is actually not the first time I've gotten Logan Thomas. Yeah. No, he's be my tight end. Yeah. Okay, I don't think the who's even the, the commander's backup tight end. <laughs> I, I think it might be Jeremy lot. Sprinkle still. Oh, I got that cold. So my wide receiver one. Give me Michael Pittman. That's solid too. Getting that franchise tag. So this will be the spin for my offensive line. Well, you didn't you already get the Jets O line? We might have to redo I did. that. So spin. yeah, we'll do do a respin there. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get the same one twice, unfortunately. All right. So, uh, we do like to land on teams twice every once in a while. Oh, that's the Chiefs. Chiefs. Yeah. I was going to say last week, you guys landed on Kansas City Chiefs like four times. It's like, do we even need to continue? Because <laughs> yeah, that, HG got, got a, it. <laughs> that team that week was insane. Oh, that was why my, my Andy Reid, Mahomes, and Kelsey. I was like, yeah, that's. And then I spun for their defense. So we got them five times in one spin. One, one thing. Oh, Kind of unfortunately, you got the Chiefs when you were on your O line. Although they do have a really good O line. This is my running back. Oh, Nick Chubb. He's on the comeback, even through injury. You play to win the game. Well, I love Nick Chubb, dude. Dude's just like a a golem. (laughs) Gosh, he's just just an an absolute unit. Cowboys defense. defense. Okay. Let's hope it's not playoffs. (laughs) <laughs> Let's hope nobody's handing the ball off. <laughs> okay, man, you're always upsetting Playoffs? Cowboys fans. No. Dude's, <laughs> dude's going to war with the Cowboys fans. <laughs> All right, final spin here. This is going to determine who my quarterback is. The Rams. Okay, I can live with Matt Ooh, Stafford. You got a solid veteran quarterback. Cool. Your team honestly is solid this week. HG might have take HG might have taken this one early. I appreciate the confidence. I didn't. I, I'm a little concerned about the O line and the the tight end situation, but <laughs> and then I get I got Mike a solid. McCarthy. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> Man. I'm gonna I'm gonna wear a Cowboys jersey one episode just to, just to just to soften that blow a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna just wear a Cowboys jersey one day. <laughs> there we go. All right, so now our teams are put together. I'm going to go ahead and read them off here for you. Remember to vote in the comments if you think Team Caveman's team is going to win, go Team Caveman. If you think my team is going to win, you go Team HG. I got the Cowboys three times. I just realized that. For my quarterback, I got Matt Stafford. Running backs, Nick Chubb. Wide receiver, Michael Pittman. uh, Wide receiver, two, Puka Nakua. Tight end, Durham Smythe. O line, the Jets, the defense is the Colts, and my head coach is going to be Antonio Pierce. Solid there. My team here, I started with the quarterback, so I took Baker Mayfield. I got James Cook from Buffalo, CD Lamb, Juju Smith Schuster. My tight end is Logan Thomas. I got the Chiefs O line, the Cowboys defense, and all while being coached by the boy. Mike McCarthy. Big Mike. Just realized while I wrote down his name that I got the Cowboys three times. So <laughs> as much as I hate on them, they are going to lock it in for me this yeah, week. They're, they're go Team Caveman. Ah, go Team HG. Puka. Really good cool. spins there for at least the order that you had to go. That was very solid. So, also, let us know what you guys thought of this where you know we take away kind of our ability to pick what position and we just were locked in down the list. And let us know which one you like better. But next week, we're probably going to go build some more NBA playoff lineups again. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Don't want to miss that too. It's about nine o'clock now here. We're going to go ahead and go take a quick break. But yeah, when we come back, we got yeah. UFL week two recap, and we're going to take a look at the NBA playoff picture and what we got going on there. Stay with us.
It's a 5 a.m. hike up the mountain to watch the sun rise. It's saluting the flag in honor of the brave men who died. It's a small piece of land that reaps what you sow. Your child's first breath and then watching them grow. Respecting one another though you may disagree. You don't hold it against them, that's freedom to me. Some pray to God, some go their own way. We're all raised different, but we're all the same. And it doesn't matter if you disagree. What's freedom to you? That's freedom to me. It's riding a trusty old horse down a dusty dirt road. Casting your fly line in a stream that nobody knows. It's spending your life with the girl of your dreams And being a grandpa like mine was to me And building a business without a degree Cause you worked your ass off, that's freedom to me Some were raised hunting, some think that's a shame we're all taught different, but we're all the same And it doesn't matter if you disagree What's freedom to you, that's freedom to me There's 50 to choose from, pick one and be free I don't tell you how to live, so don't do that to me Some think that's a shame and We're all taught different But we're all the same And it doesn't matter If you disagree What's freedom to you That's freedom to me Some pray to God Some go their own way But we're all raised different But we're all the same And it doesn't matter if you disagree, what's freedom to you, that's freedom to me. What's freedom to you, that's freedom to me. Do you ever just read a text message and think, what a psycho? But usually hit that pin and send anyway. Me too. That's why you're listening to MBR, station giving veterans a voice. It's a fun little intro right there. New giveaway that we've got going, our secret word of the week. If you want to get involved on this week's, on this uh, month's contest, the word of the week is cannabis. So if you want to get involved, it's the... I believe it's the link that H Train had put in the chat there. You just copy paste that one into your browser and then you can get involved through there. So go ahead and uh, check it out. What are we giving away this week, H Train, or this month? It's a, it's a uh, 420 basket. So I think it's going to be oh, a on. shirt and a beanie for sure. And then okay. maybe probably some like samples of CBD oil and stuff like that. The whole value of it is going to be 80 bucks. So oh, it's going right, to be a pretty good yeah, basket. You, you okay. definitely want to get in on that. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is the person that's sponsoring the basket, they have the podcast on MBR, the dog days that happens every Sunday morning. 
And, you know, they have a, a company called Tribal Hemp Company. So make sure you uh, support them and, you know, veteran business. We have a couple Sydney, of cannabis I'm enthusiasts. I'm a cannabis enthusiast. <laughs> she also works in the cannabis industry over at Dost, edible maker. She's at work right now, actually doing that. Good morning, Sydney. Doing Thanks God's for watching. Work, Sydney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she always brings home samples. They never have the THC in it. That NHL playoff picture. Give us some time, Kyle. And <laughs> trust me. He's trust training me, we'll get you on guys. that. We'll get on that. We got you. Whipping it up. Heck yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back into it. We're on to the UFL. Week two went down. Some pretty good games, actually. This spring league, man, it's shaping up to be pretty good. I think as these teams Dramas, man. as these teams get you know more comfortable playing with each other, because obviously there's a, been a lot of changes to how they were last year with, uh, you know, a bunch of teams being dissolved, and so other guys had to had to get rostered on the other squads. But teams are starting to put it together already, and it's 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 been a lot of fun. I mean, to start off the weekend, we had an, a, a great game. San Antonio Brahmas, they came back. They were down what thirteen? It was thirteen 14? to zero all the way up until the fourth, all the way up until the fourth quarter. Yeah. And then it was around, it was like 16 to seven and then Brahma's just kept putting it on them and they got a final game winning drive. There's 48 seconds left in the game. Yeah, they so, converted on a fourth and 12 and they scored the game winning touchdown to get, get the win. And that was insane. It was. Their kicker, the uh, famous YouTube star. He chose the, uh, the YouTube life over going to college because it was back in the day before the NIL and things didn't exist. So he wasn't allowed to play college football and be a YouTuber at the same time. So good for him. But he got a serious neck injury on a tackle that he made on a kickoff. And he is okay in a neck brace. And he's posted on Instagram. You know, He said, at least I cracked him. But yeah, it was just bad for him on the tackling. Up. Just gave him a little bit of a neck injury, yeah. even though he lit him up. He did kind of lead with the, the crown in your helmet. You don't want to do that. You, they always teach you, you want to get your head to the side, lead with your shoulder. So I'm, it's kind of hard to, to demonstrate on the camera. But if this mic's the person, I want to get my head out here. Just or if like you that. want to lead with your face, just make sure you got your face mask <laughs> up yeah. so you can see where you're running. <laughs> but now back to that Brahma's comeback. Yeah, they just that whole game. They were just they had trouble really getting it going. I one thing I've noticed about the XFL teams are kind of struggling to run the ball, but the quarterback play is pretty good. I mean, Chase Garber's had a, an insane game. He was like 287 yards, three touchdowns. Yeah. They had three receivers with six or more receptions. They had a guy go for like 103. Cody Latimer had eight catches for 91 in a touch, and they actually they converted. So instead of onside kicks in this league, if you want to get the ball back again, you have to go for it on a fourth and 12. And if you can convert that fourth and 12, you're from, I believe it's the 20 yard line, your drive continues there and you're, you're able to retain possession and keep going for it. But there's no onside kick. So they actually converted the first fourth and 12. And man, it was, it was by a hair. I mean, that guy, he caught it right at the sticks. Like, they they nearly didn't get that. So that was the first thing they needed to go right their way. But then they only have one timeout and 48 seconds to go down the field. But they made that. They made it work, and with four seconds left on the clock, Garbers hits Cody Latimer in the back right corner of the end zone for a touchdown. And I didn't think they were going to be able to do it, yeah. but honestly – they looked really calm out there. They did. Like the coaches and, were given the plays and there's one play that it didn't, I don't think he really liked the look, the play that they called, they were on the right hash. I think the play that they were initially calling was for the opposite side. And they, he told the coach right away, like we're on the right hash. And they instantly switched the call up. And I think it was either that play or the play after is when they scored the game winning touchdown. So they seemed like, they seem really calm under that pressure with 48 seconds. And once they score that touchdown, that just tied it. They also had to go for the one-point attempt. So, again, no extra points. 
you got to get from the two yard line. You got to, it's basically like a two point conversion, but for one, one point from the two, two points is from the five yard line. So they went for the one point attempt at the two yard line, got that. And then, you know, didn't let any crazy miracle pitches happen to, to lose them the game. But that was a really impressive comeback by the Brahmas. They are 2-0 and and the only undefeated team from the XFL concert com- conference. My Michigan Panthers took an L. They had a chance to get a... They had two chances to have a game. A game-tying drive, but could have had a game-winning drive. They got a like a game-saving interception in the back of the end zone by Keith Gibson Jr. And EJ Perry, man. I think he's got to do a better job at protecting the football but the Panthers offensive line is also just not too great. Yeah. Like the last two possessions, they gave up five, five or six sacks. <laughs> That's got, honestly kind of why they lost that game to the stallions. The st- he's, he's under so much pressure, but that is the team to beat right now. Birmingham stallions is on fire. Two and O USFL champion from last year. They're only a undefeated USFL team. So it's just the stallions and the, the Brahmas that are undefeated. Still don't know what the, what a Brahma is, but uh, we'll <laughs> we'll worry about that later. And, and I mean, really, it's their their defense. It, the Stallions they like to kind of go with two quarterbacks, like uh, Matt Corral and um, Adrian Martinez, both threw I think around fifteen pass attempts. Yeah, they and they use Martinez to run game. the ball. But you got I got you got to give it to the defense of the of the Stallions, man. Those guys were ferocious in that game. They had seven sacks. They forced two turnovers. They had eight tackles for a loss. And the Panthers just barely cracked 200 yards of total offense. They were they were just stifling. So that looks like a team where they're just going to be able to to run the ball, and you know they'll, they'll protect it. Play. I don't know, they're just going to play really good defense and beat you that way. So that that's a team where you're going to have to figure out some way to score because they can probably give you 20 to 24 a game and hold you to like 13, 14. It's pretty. So that's what we saw. We saw there the defenders and the roughnecks. They had a pretty close one. Same with your battle hawks there with the that three point win over one. the renegades. The that defenders roughnecks game that was a that was a really defensive one. Uh, Jared Garantino uh, went down early in the first for the Roughnecks, but their backup QB that came in, uh, Stidham, St- uh, Stinten, got a weird weird pronunciation. And actually played really well. Only threw one touchdown pass, but he he for the limited time he had, he threw like 217 yards, touchdown, no interceptions pretty high completion percentage against a really good defender's defense. But ultimately wasn't enough. The defenders, they, they scored 11 unanswered in the fourth quarter Damn. to, to take the win there. And they're, they're actually 10 and 0 at home. So that's the power of the beer snake <laughs> on full display. Those of you don't that's know. The good know. luck charm. The, the defenders stadium, man, every, Every home game they have a massive beer snake is put together where it's just somebody finishes a beer and you pass it down. They have a, just a snake of cups. It runs from like the, that's awesome. The top of the stands all the way down to the bottom. It's, it's incredible. I think it set a world record one point for longest beer snake at a professional sporting event. It's like the wave, you know, when everybody in the crowd is doing it, it goes around <laughs> That's like, I love that. I love that about sports. Everyone, like the fans getting involved in just like random antics during the game, but they're all still paying attention to the game. It's beautiful. We need more of that. We need the Denver Nuggets. We got to come up with something that the fans could do at the stadium. I'll say. Also, we do want to give a shout out to the the Roughnecks Corn Elder. Even in the losing effort, he had a 98-yard pick six, which is the longest in spring league, uh, his- longest pick six in spring league history. So you sent me this in my my chat during my live stream. I had to look it up. This is honestly what a what a sick name, Corn, Corn Elder. Elder. 98-yard so, pick six for the boy Corn. That's that's one of those great names. I'm just and gonna call them on the cob another, for the rest of the season. Another, uh, <laughs> you guys. Hopefully, you know who I'm talking about. 
another all-time name that was an all-time name going into the NFL draft is now getting another chance here in the XFL. That's Taco Charlton. He's also playing on the the Stallions, I believe. He got the game-winning sack on EJ Perry. Some sick names in this draft. You got Kool-Aid McKinstry and Chop Robinson and all these all these awesome names. All right. Then the final game of the weekend. This actually happened on Saturday after the Brahmas, but this will be the final one we cover. The Battle Hawks versus the the Renegades. The Renegades, the Houston, Arlington Renegades. Arlington. That this was an incredible back and forth game. Tons of big plays. Uh, AJ McCarron was just dotting up people. Marcel Aitman went off. He had four catches for one fourteen and two touchdowns. And I think the Battle Hawks, from what I've seen so far, have the best run game now that they have uh, Mateo Durant back. He he had 104 and a touch on 14 carries, so he was a, an excellent downhill runner. And, I mean, that final drive to get him in the field goal range, he had, like, two really big runs that helped set that up. Like two 15-plus yard runs there at the end to get them, get the Battle Hawks in the field goal range and it was just a chip shot. They lost on the long field goal last week, won it on a chip shot this week. And that, that stadium is electric. St. Louis loves football. They, like, I'm glad they have some sort of team back there and they might have the Chiefs soon, which. Oh yeah. Boo, but <laughs> <laughs> if, if they end up moving because the taxpayers refuse to build a new stadium for them, which uh, good on Kansas city fans. They're like, so, I, so that the, always bothers me that NFL owners like try to get like taxpayer do- money to subsidize their stadiums. Like you're a billionaire, you pay for it yourself. So, the, 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 so this, so this is something that I'm I'm starting to see a pattern, and I'm telling you this pattern in, in the future. It's it's going to even not even it, it's going to lose an NFL's fan base because. This isn't the only time this has happened. Recently, the stadium, the whole thing with the Los Angeles Chargers and the um, Oakland Raiders, you know, this this is going to keep on happening. And especially with um, Kraft selling the Patriots, start watching how they, they might lose their team as well because of the, the stadium. Lot, yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. And I mean, the NFL really is playing themselves out of the marketing. Like they're going for the big wigs and stuff like that. But sooner or later, the big wigs, they're going to be hurting because when's the last time you've been to a football game, HG? Oh, uh, I went to the Broncos win over the Chiefs in what was that, week seven, week eight? Right. And how much was that ticket? Uh, I'm not sure. It was. It was, it was given, over 300, right? I don't know. It was given to me as a gift because it was like a week okay. before my birthday. So, right now, you can't buy a Broncos ticket for less than $300. That is insane. And that's nosebleeds. That's, that's nosebleeds for a really bad Because team. we got to pay these players salaries and stuff. I mean, every time I see a salary going up, you know, they, you know, news break. Uh, 300 million for one year, you know, anything like that. The first thing I think of is, man, if they keep on building this salary up, like who, who's going to pay this? Because I know I can't afford an NFL ticket. Yeah, that's... that moving into the uh, the streaming service world with their uh, Thursday night on Prime and the Peacock exclusive games, that's helping. But I I see your point that everything, even basketball games, are super expensive get to get expensive. in the high seats. Nuggets didn't used to be, but now that they're yeah. pretty good, now they oh, are. Yeah, now, now they're that was pretty good. Oh now, yeah, now it, it kind of makes sense. I was I was looking expensive. at tickets to the game tonight, and I was like, Oof, never mind. Holy mm-hmm. crap! Yeah, I don't just... even want to watch the Broncos for free right now. <laughs> Put that, um, put that one Sydney, up there real quick. Sydney, you're killing us. <laughs> oh my god. Amen to that. Amen to that. My my team's in the same boat. My team doesn't have a quarterback either. We we do, but he's making so much money to you know play mid. 
we're, I'm in the same scenario over here as a Saints fan. I got I got Russell Wilson 2.0 over here with Derek Carr. So we, I I feel y'all's pain. Oh. We are we're in the same boat. All right, it's it's nine nineteen. We're gonna move on to the NBA playoff picture. Uh, one more thing on the the UFL side before we move on the the Battle Hawks uh, attendance at their home stadium, the Battle Dome, which just great Sick name man. for a stadium, Sick awesome man. name for a stadium. They broke the spring league attendance record. They had forty thousand one hundred and thirty seven fans in attendance. That is a spring league record. That's awesome. And I mean, you could hear it in that stadium, man. That place was electric. It, that's great for the spring league if they can figure out how to get some of these other teams as up to the the level that the Battle Hawks had. But they they had more people at the stadium at that stadium than when like Beyonce performed there, the Rolling Stones performed there, or, or Bon Jovi. That is a, that's really some, good. Some big named artists and St. Louis man, they love football. But I want to see it grow. I want to see some more teams added into that league. You know, four four games a week is pretty good to cover, though. Honestly, well, I, the NFL keeps getting more expensive. People are just going to go to the right? UFL, go right? to UFL games. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to the NBA playoff picture here, we're gonna we're gonna pull up the standings. Uh, a lot of the stuff actually kind of got solidified last night, or f- has fallen more mm-hmm. into place. Uh, one of the big things, the Mavericks, they've locked themselves up in a playoff spot so they are in the five right they're now. no longer a playing team they are guaranteed a playoff spot and i mean they've been playing so good they've, they've been on a, a tear yeah. recently i mean i a few weeks ago i didn't think it would be possible for this team to be a 50 win team they're sitting at 49 and 30 they now i definitely think they can they can win at least one more chance, yeah. and either maybe, maybe they won't they might now that they're like locked into a playoff spot they might be able to jump the Clippers, but the Nuggets, Thunder, and Timberwolves are all too far out of reach there. So the top three are locked in the West. Four and five could switch. These playing teams are where it gets pretty interesting. Because yes. you got the Pelicans, who just jumped the Suns last night. They got the one-game lead there. The Kings are only down one game on the Suns. And the Warriors and Lakers are only separated by one game. So the 7, 8, 9, and 10 seed and the 6 in the West are all very, very close. So a lot of things could possibly change here in this next day or two. This is going to be really interesting. The East, on the other hand, is where it gets pretty rocky. The Celtics and the Bucks are pretty your solid picks there, but from the 4 down all the way into the, the eight is is so hectic right now. It's separated by two games. Like the Magic are two games ahead of the Miami Heat, and the Magic are the fourth spot, the Heat are the eighth spot. It so yeah, every game down the stretch for these East teams counts because I mean uh, this is unprecedented where we could see you know a team be in the fourth spot into the plan or vice versa over these next few games there's only about each team only has two three games left on the season for a lot of these teams they they matter a lot and tonight is pretty much the there's the deciding factor and who's going to be the one seed in the the west i believe we got the nuggets and timberwolves both 55 and 24 24. winner to watch out for tonight winner of this i you got to win this and then pretty much win out um, if you're the Nuggets. Or and I think the Nuggets, the, if the Timberwolves win, they have the advantage on the season series on us. Uh, but if the, the Nuggets, if they win and win out, they can pretty much lock up the, the one seed because they'll have just one one less loss than the Timberwolves do. So this is a, this is a big game. This is pretty much a deciding factor for the one seed. Got the in the West here. T Wolves, and then our final two games are against the Spurs and the Grizzlies. So a pretty high chance that we actually could win out, as the last two games are against teams that are not in playoff contention. But it also, you know, might want to give your guys some night, a night off before the playoffs. 
So that's po- it's a possibility. Well, it depends on what happens to the Timberwolves too. Because yeah, yeah, even if we do beat them, and but they they win their final games of the season, like yeah, you're gonna have to win out because they, even with this win, I believe they they have one more game on us in the season series. And they're mm. leading that three to one right now, and this would make it three to two, but it's still their advantage. But right, I got some uh, some percentage chances for a lot of these playoff teams here. ESPN released this these. Will be- just last night, we're going to take a look at the, the play-in picture here and just what percentage each team's kind of got here. So we're going to start with the 9 and 10 seeds. That's the Hawks and the Bulls. They are locked into the plan. They are guaranteed the 9 and 10 seeds. They they might be able to flip-flop unlikely. I think it'll be the Bulls at the 9, Hawks at the 10. So they're going to play in the 9-10 game. To make the playoffs out of that, the Hawks have a 15% chance. The Bulls have an 11% chance. So even though they make the play in, not a great chance that they advance and, and go to the playoffs. Now we come down to the, the seven and eight teams. So right now the 76ers and the Miami heat Sixers have a 71% chance uh, to make the play in and the 71% chance to make the seven, eight game but they do have a 92% chance of making the playoffs. So they're in pretty good position, even at the plan. So the Heat, 70% chance that they make the, the plan of the 7-8 game and about a 91% chance that they make the playoffs. So while the favorite, the odds are leaning heavy towards it being the Heat Sixers as that 7-8 game, the Pacers and Magic do still have a possibility of dropping in there. The Magic are sitting at a 36% chance of making the 7-8 game, but they still have a 93% chance to make the playoffs. Pacers are at about a 20% chance to make the play-in game, but they're sitting at a 98% chance to make the playoffs. So those that, that four through eight, they're all in the best position. You know, they, they have the most favorable odds to make the playoffs. The Hawks and Bulls are hiding down there at 910 with a slight chance now you come over here to the west and it is there's a lot of crazy percentages over here so for the play-in tournament because they can't say 100 percent, it says that the warriors and lakers have a greater than 99 percent chance to make the play-in uh would that be the seven, eight game? Well, for the Warriors, there's a 35% chance of that they make that. For the Lakers, there's a 13% chance. What about the 9-10 game? Well, 65% chance for the Warriors that they make the 9-10 game. 87% chance for the Lakers. The Warriors are sitting about a 48% chance to make the playoffs. Lakers have a 27% chance. And then let's let's drop it down a little bit. We'll go to the Kings. They are sitting at about a 97% chance to make the plan. They took another loss to the Mavericks tonight, which really hurt them. Uh, so what game do the odds favor them to be in? Well, for the 7-8 game, it's around a 66% chance. And then for the 9-10 game, there's around a 31% chance for them. And they're sitting at just a 54% chance to make the playoffs. So it's over half, but that's definitely not as high and not as a sure yeah. thing as some of these higher seeds in the East. It makes it interesting. And then the Suns around the 77% chance to make the play in. They got, it's a 66% chance to make the seven, eight game. There's a 12% chance that they make the nine, 10 game, 79% chance that they make the playoffs. So of the play in teams right now, they are favored the most to make the playoffs. And then the Pelicans who are sitting at the five seed, could potentially get jumped. There's about a 26% chance they make the play-in. If they, that does happen, they're saying around 20% chance that that's a 7-8 game, 6%. It's a 9-10. So very unlikely that they drop that far and a 92% chance that they make the playoffs, whether that be going through the play-in or just securing the spot the old-fashioned way. So as you can see, even though we're late into the season, just major, major implications for the playoffs. Nothing really set in stone yet besides, you know, a few really dominant seeds that have been in the East that are going to be pretty much locked into the one and two. And then the top three in the West, there might be just some movement there. 
but it, even with a few games left in the season and a very, uh, very ever changing landscape in the NBA playoff picture. Oh yeah. It's, I'd like the addition of the play in. It makes things a little bit more interesting once you get to the end of the season. Cause then it's not like those final four teams aren't battling with their last few games and trying to win out. They, they can play a little bit more strategically when they come into those final, final games there. But it is around 9.30 here. Let me get hands on this mouse real quick so I can send this on a quick music break before our final two segments. But we've got branching out and WrestleMania weekend just happened. So you know we got to cover WrestleMania. Oh. He's going to be going over the Olympics a little bit. Yeah, some, of the, some of the newer sports that they've, they've added to the Olympics. That have either been that were in the last ones or new coming to this one, so stay with us and also, you know, drop some of your predictions for the NBA playoffs and the play in. Who do you think is going to be where? But let us know. Stay with us, folks. We're going to go to a quick break. This is Who You Are by Barbara Sim. There's a story in every one of us Not one of them the same There's something about the human heart These hearts, they can't be tamed There's something wild in us all Something stirring and untamed Like the flicker of a growing flame Casting light in our own name Let it shine, let it shine Let it show just who you are Let it shine, let it shine don't be ashamed of where you are Like the storyline of a book We all have to start somewhere and There's a challenge, something to overcome Something to make us turn the page Every chapter, every line and There's a purpose every time All the bad and all the good Makes you exactly you Let it shine, let it shine Let it show just who you are let it shine, let it shine Don't be ashamed of where you are So let it shine, let it shine Let it show just who you are Let it shine, let it shine Don't be ashamed of who you are Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Find us on the web at mbradio.us. I want to make it clear that the views expressed by our hosts are not considered the official stance of MBR views. Remember, this is all about having fun and enjoying the ride. 
And welcome back to HGTV Sports in the Cave. We missed a comment. Nuggets repeat. Lakers don't make it out of the play-in. Nuggets Celtics finals. I like that. That's a good prediction. Yeah, man. The only thing that LA has going for them is that free throw def- differential that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's definitely been a, a, a shaky season for them. It's really like their only defender right now is Anthony Davis. And, you know, he's so injury prone. He was out last night with an eye injury. And they were playing a team. They were playing the nine seed. They were playing the Warriors last night. So it's kind of a big game that they needed them in. Draymond had some big threes last night in that game. But it was, it's something. It's something that they need to. It's something they definitely say, need to address. Just from the two Nuggets Celtics games we've got this year. Yes, please. If that's a, if we have a seven that game, so fun series with that. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm there. I'm about I'm that for it. Let's go. Let's get right. into our weekly segment for HG branching out. Be branching out this week. I see the ring chip. Why is it when I see right. the branches out? Well, the video is hiding itself, so that's all right. No worries. So. Oh, here we go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> We are. So for my branching out this week, you know, there's been a number of new sports that have come to the Olympics. We had a few new ones last year that got their debut. And there's another new one coming this year. So I figured, you know what, let's, uh, for those that aren't familiar, I'll give you a little breakdown of the rules and what's going on. And I also got some favorites to win gold. So I want to start with the newest sport. Because this one sounds awesome. Breakdancing. Yep. You heard me. Breakdancing. <laughs> that is the newest Olympic sport that we got coming to Paris in 2024. So it's gonna there's gonna be two medal rounds. Got 16 B boys and 16 B girls. They're gonna comp- compete in one-on-one duels. Participants are gonna take turns in throwdowns, each lasting 60 seconds. You wanna to impress the judges. My mom says she can break dance. I would like to see that. <laughs> All right, let, let's get you. To, let's get you on Team USA. Let's get you out to to Paris. <laughs> um, right. So the judges they're going to be awarding the score based on six criteria: creativity, personality, technique, versatility, performance skill, and musicality. So. Creativity, technique, and performance skill. That's going to account for about 60% of your score, while versatility, personality, and musicality will count for about 40% of your score. So obviously the keyword break. Ooh, ooh, shots fired by Kyle there. That's our mom. You watch your mouth. <laughs> Be your own kids, huh? Um, so... The the create obviously creativity, your technique, and just like your overall skills as a performer. Though that's where the big base of your points is going to come from. But I like it's not too much of your points, so you can make it up on the back end a little bit. But they do want you to focus more on your on the creativity and your technique and just your overall ability to engage the audience. So I think audience reaction is going to be a huge one in here, which on how judges score. If you can wow the audience and get the biggest reactions, that's where you're gonna. That's where you can see some of these big scores. So it's gonna be for the women's qualifier. That's gonna be an eight nine from four to six p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then just a few hours later that same day, from eight to ten, they're going to have the finals, and then the next day the men will have their qualifiers from four to six p.m. Eastern, and then their finals from eight to ten Eastern as well that following Saturday. So eight, eight, nine and eight, 10. If you want to watch some break dancing competition, that's when it'll be going down here for these summer Olympics. That's going to be cool. I'm actually pretty excited. For All that. right. I've never heard of that. So some of the favorites that I found that while I was reading up on this. So on the men's side, we've got a couple of people. There's three time world champion from Canada, Phil wizard. And then there's a Japanese break dance star. I'm going to try to get his name right. She G kicks 
are some of the favorites to go gold for the, the men's side. Uh, for the women, we got Japanese B-girl Ami, who won the 2022 World Championship. And then we got an American girl, her name's Logistics, spelled L-O-G-I-S-T-X, as another, another favorite. And then we got breakdancing legend Ayami, who's 39, but still a favorite to maybe win gold or at least potentially medal. Ooh, okay. So the to- timeless wonder in the, the world of breakdancing. So our next sport, which got its debut in the 2020 Tokyo Olympics after people petitioning for it to be added to the Olympic Games for over 100 years. But uh, 1920 is when people first started petitioning for it, and they finally got it 100 years later. That's surfing. And so for surfers, what you're going, they're going to perform maneuvers and tricks on waves that will be scored by five judges. So it's going to be based on your variety, type, and the difficulty of said tricks. Uh, surfers are going to be also judged on the speed, power, and flow. And that's just basically how they, how how seamless and smooth it looks as they're riding out there on the ocean on the waves. So uh, this was in the 2020 Olympics. That's when Brazilian Italio uh, Fieria took gold for the men, and then America's Carissa Moore took gold for the women. So for the favorites, Carissa is a big favorite to win gold again. And then we got John Florence also from America, who's a big favorite to win gold on the men's side. Now, another uh, sport that was just recently added to the Olympics, it was in Tokyo 2020, skateboarding. And this one, this is another one I'm, I'm excited for. A lot, all of these sound like pretty cool. I, I'm Definitely looking forward to checking out these out and seeing how they go. So skateboarding. The 2020 skateboarding was really cool. Yeah. I enjoyed that. So for skateboarding, you're gonna there's gonna be two types of disciplines. You compete in park and street. And so people there there'll be people that medal in both park and street. You can potentially medal in both. But how the judges are going to judge these, so you're going to be judged on your tricks, your degree degree of difficulty, the speed, and the ranges of moves, as well as like the height and speed of the tricks that you do, uh, your capacity to use the entire surface and maneuver around obstacles. You get to perform three 45-second runs with the best of the three, counting as your final score. Uh, so in 2020, Japan kind of dominated. They had like five out of like eight, of, of the total medalists were Japanese. So Japan's a huge skateboarding company. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, both both champs for the men, uh, Yoto uh, Horigom and women Moji Nishia are favorites to repeat. But we also got American Jaeger Etherton, who's thought to be a favorite in both park and street. So, you know, the these are newer sports, so they are leading towards repeat champions as they just, you know, these are the, the early dominant people in these sports as more people get into it. I think we're, we'll begin to see more parody there and who knows plenty of shocking upsets can happen in the Olympics as well. Oh yeah. That's going to be really cool. This three new events. Yeah. And then our final one is sports climbing. Excuse me, four new events. Yeah, so this is the final new sport that's coming to the Olympics. Uh, So there's three formats. Bouldering, where athletes are going to climb up a 4.5-meter wall without ropes in a limited period of time and the fewest attempts. Then there's the speed climb. It's a race against the clock in one-on-one elimination rounds. You're going to athletes scale a 15-meter high and five-degree inclined wall in under six seconds for the men and under seven seconds for women. So that's about... Now, on these two events, you do get to see the wall ahead of time, so you're able to plan that a little bit and plan how you're going to do your climb. So the speed climb is like you got to just go as fast as you can, but that that, that incline is where it gets, in, gets interesting. I yeah. took adventure in uh, high school because my high school had a rock climbing wall in their gyms and the inclined wall was a real son of a gun 
That's all I'm gonna say. That was that was a tough one. Not a lot of people were able to get to the top on that one. So now you got to do that in under six seconds. I'm I'm real interested to see how that goes. But the one I think I'm most excited for, it's the lead and pull event. And this is where athletes are going to climb as high as you can on a wall that's over 15 meters high Ooh. in six minutes. But in this one, the wrinkle is you don't get to see the route ahead of time. So athletes are going to be going into this completely blind until they get up to the wall. Whoa. And then they're probably just going to have a minute, maybe two, as they get secured and into place to plan their route up the wall. But the route's going to get more challenging and complex as they go on. That's going to be interesting because climbing in general, you have to be like a contortionist with your body. You go in different weird angles and like got to twist yourself out of it. Once you get your grips, this, that's going to be interesting. This, this last one is the, they're saying it's going to require the entire physical and mental ability of the athlete. Oh yeah. As they go up and it's going to require making you know, split second decisions who calls. I mean, just, just choosing, to go for the wrong rock could cost you valuable, valuable seconds. So this one's going to be really interesting. No, so I'm, I'm liking that one the most. Going to let K-Man get over to his recap of WrestleMania. Uh, let me know in the comments which one of these new sports you think is the coolest, which ones you're the most excited for, which ones you're looking forward to seeing. But K-Man, we had a huge weekend Very. Uh, in Wrestle in the wrestling world over the weekend. Why don't you get into that for us? We're going to get into a segment of ringside chats. I'm like really slow today, guys. I'm so sorry. I don't know why. <laughs> Oh, I mean, a huge weekend. I want to talk about Cody and Roman for this entire time. Oh, yes. But I, I'm not going to. I got to talk about the other matches first. All right. I'm going to join the conversation. So we this. saw Gunther was dethroned after 666 days. I did not think Sami Zayn was going to win that belt at all. But it, he, it was a great match. He got a beautiful moment with his uh, wife who's, after. Who's the announcer for WWE, that girl? Because you saw the reaction... That she had before she announced that he had won. I mean, like she looked like she was about ready to cry. She's very emotional. Uh, I mean, everybody was emotional. Well, yeah. no, the, the, it, she she's she's colored, and I don't know what her name is. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, dang, she, she has a TikTok as like the announcer, and she she she, she honestly reminds me of. Uh, Julia, if you remember the the old announcer for WWF, Julia, she used to sing like the national anthem and stuff. Yeah, she is actually she is the fiance of WWE superstar Ricochet. Oh, okay. So that is his wife. They met on the job, obviously. Okay. But yeah, she she was very emotional when uh, Cody got the win there. It was awesome. It was a huge moment. But back to the uh, Intercontinental Championship match Sorry. there. Uh, Sami Zayn got the win there, which is honestly really surprising because I thought they were going to have Chad Gable go and win it. Like, I thought Chad Gable was going to get the storyline continued, but I think now maybe time due for a Chad Gable heel turn, and we could see a pretty cool rivalry against with him and Sami. But the moment that Sami Zayn had after the match him and his wife, good hug. I mean, they were both in tears after the match. So that was awesome. That was a great way to kick off night one. So uh, Bianca Belair, Jade Cargill, and Naomi, it was the first time that we ever saw three African-American women on the same match in WrestleMania. And they, they're they great. So obviously, you know, hats off to them. Round of applause for a good match there against Damage Control. They did not get the win over the over them to get the tag team belts it was still a good performance there our tag team matches oh my mom just saw my brother's comment <laughs> <laughs> those ta the tag team <laughs> matches were one pretty pretty solidifying i did not like the winners though a town down under they win the smackdown titles 
and the awesome truth won the raw titles. I like the Miz and R Truth winning for Raw, but Austin Theory and Grayson Waller is the most comedic relief champions I've ever seen in my life. They're really good, but they're like they're just mid card, man. They need to like they need to revamp their characters a little bit. And I would maybe appreciate them winning it more. But it's like, ah, man, like they're, we're going to see a really short title reign from those two, which is unfortunate because you had so much star power in the match. And well, let's move on to night two. They opened it off. Seth against Drew. It was honestly a pretty cool match. Drew McIntyre grabbed his wife's phone, which is logged in on his Twitter account, and he tweeted, bored at work, lol. Mid-match. It was it was pretty funny. <laughs> Him and Seth went at it. I thought he was going to beat Seth in the opening match because he just instantly hit him with this finish. Right after the bell rung, he just Claymore kicked him and went for the pin, and it was a two count. And I was like, whoa. I was pretty shocked at seeing that. Honestly, the whole night, too, while I was watching, like every five minutes, I was like, oh, really watching and reacting to it with my friends. But it was a, it was a pretty solid match there. Drew McIntyre, I think he might have a world record for the fastest title run in, in WWE history. He was the champion for a good two minutes. He got his moment in front of the, no, the live that, crowd. No, so, oh, um, here oh, comes gosh. Damian Priest. I forget what his name is. He's the uh, he's the Italian Selena or something. M M Mario Selena. He would have the shortest time because he got the belt, used the money in the bank, and then he oh, got... Santino Morello. Yeah, that's that it. Dude. That's it. <laughs> that guy was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I miss him, dude. <laughs> But he's the one that has the shortest because I, I believe he got the title and then then the Ultimate Warrior did the thing or whatever and then he lost. You remember what I'm talking about, right? He would instantly lose. He was the guy that put like the <laughs> the arm sleeve on and his move was like a snake bite with his hand because he had like an arm sleeve on. People would sell it so cool though, like they literally just got bit by a snake. And they would like cinch up their body. They would go all stiff. I miss him so much, man. He needs to make a comeback next. That would be amazing. <laughs> but yeah, he, Damian Priest with the, an amazing cash in. I mean, I thought he was going to, I thought he was going to attempt to cash in and then fail. And that would start a, you know, a feud where he would actually get removed from the judgment day. But now I'm having, I'm starting to think we might see a face turn from Damian Priest and Rhea Ripley. Because on Monday they went out to uh, showcase the new the new belts. Because they Rhea and Damian actually have matching championships now. The logo on there looks the same for their belt. But it they had a their little post promo brawl session, and as usual, Damian and Rhea so they stood to the side untouched, just kind of with their championships. Maybe could see some things change with them and the Judgment Day. I really like the Judgment Day though. They're pretty they're pretty dominant, but also not they're in the middle. You know, they don't win as much as, or as often, but they're they get a lot of TV time where they're out there a pretty good amount. So they are talented, but it's not like they're just always winning every single match. Yeah, it was a very awesome one. Now let's get into this main event here. Okay. Seth and Cody, the storytelling of this match was honestly like it was hands down one some of the best storytelling I've seen in wrestling in my entire life. It was it's crazy because you think about how Roman and Seth lost and the, how their involvement was in this story. Honestly, Seth lost his championship because he was too worried about helping Cody with Roman, and Roman lost his championship because he was too worried about getting back at Seth. For the betrayal that happened in the Shield when they, you know, they debuted in the same tag team together. And they had a moment there where when Seth uh, turned on the Shield, he had his, Roman had his back turned to Seth and he hits him in the back with the chair. Roman has a steel chair. He has the opportunity to hit Cody and, you know, like win the match or hit Seth. And he pulled and a he, Walla Morgan. 
and he hit Seth, <laughs> and he hit Seth, and it was like an awesome parody. It was like an awesome callback to how that happened. It was just like Roman got his revenge, so it was like he was okay with losing. And we saw some great comebacks. First, it was just Jimmy and Jay Uso fighting. They had an awesome spot where they tackled each other off the stage and went through a couple tables. John Cena came out and gave Solo Sokoa the attitude adjustment through the announce table. And then the rock interest music hit. He gave Cena a rock bottom in the middle of the ring. And then the church bells rang and the lights went out. And I was honestly so shocked. I thought it was going to be Stone Cold. Right. I thought it was we just going to be all John thought it Cena. Was going to be Stone Cold. And even the prediction people, like they were spot on on everything, but they threw us for a loop when it was The Undertaker. And there was a lot of people upset. We were talking about that earlier. There were a lot of people that were upset because, you know, they wanted Stone Cold instead of The Undertaker. But uh, The Undertaker fits the story a little bit better because. Evidently, Undertaker was one of the last matches that he lost against Reigns, so it's kind of like a, a payback, and I didn't know that. Yep. And one of, uh, I believe one of The Rock's final few matches during his you know, big prime was against uh, The Undertaker as well. It was when he Undertaker was getting ready to retire, too. He wasn't even really The Undertaker anymore. It was when he was riding out on his Harley Davidson during his entrances stuff he wasn't he was kind of coming out of the shell he was the great he was the american badass back in those days but it was just an awesome comeback and i like how they kept it short and sweet it was, the bells rang the lights went out the undertaker was there they had the big moment and the rock sold it perfectly like i don't know if you saw those the rock is didn't lose a step i honestly was not happy to see him at first when he made his return because i don't like, I don't like the Hollywood guys coming you, to make you their You want to know what the biggest shock was for me for the whole WrestleMania? The biggest shock for me was Stephanie McMahon came out. Yeah, that was pretty cool, too. Yeah, that was the biggest shock. That that right there tells me that all that past drama, it's worked out. That's what that tells me. And I think that's a clear message that they were trying to send out to the WWE Universe that – you know, there's gonna be there's gonna be people to try to take you down in life. Yeah, they come back right up. So yeah, can't let uh, them take you down. Good, you know the loyalty and that relationship between Triple H and Stephanie. Yeah, been together for such a long time. I mean, it was like Triple H was a a superstar still when he was you know first like getting involved with Stephanie. But I it was surprising to see her come back. And honestly, it's just surprising to see Cody win. Roman has been the champion since COVID. He's had that belt. Some of the earliest clips you find of Roman with the Universal Championship is him where the screens and the fans around him are all like monitors. And it's all <laughs> fans and viewers viewing from home. So the fact that he's been champion for that long, you know, I'm sure some people double take the other TV when they saw the ref, you know, actually counted to three there. I saw a video of this little kid bawling his eyes out. And this kid is probably like five or six. It was like, he can't believe Roman lost. He's been the champion since he was two years old. Basically his whole, his whole life, <laughs> his whole childhood that his favorite wrestler has been the champion. And he just watched him lose after that. Like, that would, I would be pretty heartbroken too. It was such a good match though. I'm glad that Cody got his moment. I think, we're due probably for another pretty long title reign, so strap yourselves in. We'll see what happens with the first few storylines because we actually don't know who Cody's first rivalry is going to be now that he's the champion. We don't know whose first defense is going to be. Oh, I guarantee I know. It's going to be Seth Rollins because he lost his championship. So he's going to That's say true. That's true. That, ooh, you know, remember I said a couple weeks ago that Seth Rollins is extremely boring as the good guy? Yeah. Here we go. Now we can get <laughs> Seth Rollins to not be boring again. He gets to be there the villain we go. again. Man, Seth Rollins, when you pulled off the greatest heist in history, that's when you were at your peak. When you were, when you were really the visionary, when you were just screwing people over left and right and the fans like genuinely hated Seth, that's when he was at his top. 
But that's it for this week's episode. We'll be back next week with episode 16. So things so we probably will most likely cover UFL week three, more of that NBA playoff picture, maybe the NHL playoff picture. You guys will never know until we'll until the show. You gotta tune in to find out. But we'll be back with you guys next week. We had a good time making the show. And we'll yeah. see everybody next Wednesday. Just before we go, go quick shout out to all of our sponsors to Freedom oh, Balls, yeah. LTD Tactical. Uh, James Aerosol, Sky Blue Radio, Basic Radio, DV Radio, Duncan, and Jersey Mike's. Big thanks to them. They make this show possible. And big thank you to you, the viewers, for tuning in and talking with us. We always love having you guys talk sports with us. Yes. So big thank you again to everybody who tuned in today. We will see you guys next week as we get on out of here. That's the show for today, everyone. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with an all-new show. And remember, you can listen to us again and again. The podcast of this radio show is available right after we go off the air tonight. Anywhere that you can get your podcast episodes. And thanks for joining us today. I'd like to take a moment to talk.